Welcome to this session of my tutorial on capital budgeting decision. If you are coming across my lecture for the first time, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss my upcoming videos. If you are a returning subscriber, I say thank you. Capital budgeting decision. In this session, I'll be examining the discounted cash flow techniques. Discounted cash flows technique. Under this technical method, we will examine the net present value and the internal rates of returns, as well as the profitability index. So, discounted cash flows techniques. As the name implies, we have cash flows here. Cash flows will be used, not the accounting profit. Unlike the accounting rates of returns, where accounting profit will be used. But under this method, we'll be, using, we'll be making use of cash flows. There are two types of cash flows. We have cash inflows, cash inflows and cash outflows. Remember when we say discounting, it means the calculation of present value. If discounting means present value, then if you calculate the present value of cash inflows and the present value of cash outflows, you net it. Net me minus. So, the present value of cash inflows minus the present value of the cash outflows will give you the net present value. So, net present value, net present value, NPV, is the difference between the present value of the cash inflows and the present value of the cash outflows. I repeat, net present value is the difference between the present value of the cash inflows and the present value of the cash outflows. Decision rule. Decision rules for net present value. Number one, we have independent project. Independent projects. Independent projects are two or more projects that can be accepted simultaneously. Acceptance of one does not affect the acceptance of others. For an independent project, accept the project with positive NPV. Number two, we have mutually exclusive projects. Mutually exclusive projects. Mutually exclusive projects are two or more projects that cannot be accepted simultaneously. Two or more projects that cannot be accepted simultaneously. If project A is accepted, B cannot be accepted. If B is accepted, C cannot be accepted. So, two or more projects that cannot be accepted simultaneously. For, uh, for a mutually exclusive project, accept the project with the highest, highest positive net present value. The one with the highest positive net present value. What are the advantages of net present value? Advantages of net present value. Number one, it recognizes, it recognizes the time value, the time value of money. Number one, it recognizes the time value of money. Number two, it gives a clear accept or reject recommendation. It gives a clear Asset or 
reject recommendation. It gives a clear accept or reject recommendation. Number three, it uses the cash flows over the entire project life. Number three, it uses the cash flows over the entire project life, unlike paper period that fails to use it, that ignores the cash flows after the paper period. Number four, it uses cash flows and not profit. It uses cash flows and not profit. After you cash flow is superior to profit when it comes to decision making. Unlike the accounting rate of returns that make use of the accounting profit. Net present value makes use of the cash flows. On the other hand, we have the internal rate of returns. Internal rate of returns. Remember, I've told you that present value, net present value, I said it is equal to the difference between present value of cash, cash inflows, minus the present value of cash outflows, cash inflows, cash outflows. This will give you the net present value. But there is a rate of returns that if you use such rate of returns, this will be equal to this. The rate of returns that equate the present value of the cash inflows to the present value of the cash outflows, that rate is said to be the internal rate of returns. I repeat, internal rate of returns is the rate of returns that equate the present value, rate of return that equate the present value of cash inflows to present value of cash outflows. The rate of return that equates the present value of cash inflows to the present value of cash outflows, that rate of return is said to be the internal rate of returns. If this is equal to this, if you bring this and this together, we have PV of cash inflows. If this one comes with it, we have minus PV of cash outflows. Then equals to what? You believe it's not equal to zero. And remember, PV of cash inflows minus PV of cash outflows is equal to the net present value. If this is equal to net present value, therefore, that means we have net present value equal to zero. Remember, PV of cash inflows minus PV of cash outflows equal to zero. And PV of cash inflow minus PV of cash outflows is equal to the net present value. That means the net present value equal to zero. Therefore, the rate of returns that equate the net present value to zero. That rate of return is said to be the internal rate of returns. Internal rate of returns, IRR, is the rate of returns that equates the net present value to zero. Or the rate of return that equates the present value of cash inflows to the present value of the cash outflows. So, calculation of internal rate of returns by interpolation method. Calculation of IRR by interpolation. IRR equals to lower rate plus the net present value at the lower rate over net present value at lower rate minus net present value at higher rate into higher rate minus lower rate. LR stands for lower rate. This is net present value at lower rate. This is net present value at lower rate. This is net present value at higher rate. This is higher rate minus this is lower rate. This is the formula for calculating the internal rate of returns by interpolation. So I've told you to make use of this formula 
two net present value must be calculated. One of the net present values must be positive, while the other one must be negative. If the calculated, the first calculated net present value, if it is positive, to get the second net present value, which will be negative, you, you, you assume a rate that is higher than your initial rate. So you assume, you just try an error method. If the first rate is 5% and you get positive MPV, you may try like 10%, depending on, and if 10% did not give you negative MPV, you may also use something higher than 10%, like let's say 30% or 20%, so to get negative MPV. And if the calculated net present value, if it is negative, if you have tried 5% and your MPV is negative, then to get a positive MPV, you use a rate that is lower than your first rate. You might try like, let's say 2% or 1% in order to get positive MPV. So two net present value must be calculated. One of the net present value must be positive and the other one must be negative for the purpose of internal rates of returns. What are the decision rules? Decision rules for IRR, internal rates of returns. We have number one, independent project. Independent, independent projects. Independent project. Accept the project with error greater than or equal to the one set by the management. Accept the project. Accept the project with IRR greater than or equal to the one set by the management. Number two. We have mutually exclusive projects. Mutually exclusive projects. For a mutually exclusive project, then you accept the project with the IRR greater than the cut of rate indicated. Accept the project with IRR greater than the cut of rate indicated. Therefore, what are the advantages of IRR? Advantages of internal rate of returns. Advantages of IRR. Number one, it recognizes the time value of money. Number one, it recognizes the time value of money it recognizes the time value of money number two it uses cash flows it uses cash flows rather than profit than profit unlike the accounting rate of returns that make use of the profit it considers the whole life of the project. It consider. let me say it consider. It consider the cash flows. It consider the cash flows over the entire life. The entire life of the project. It consider the cash flows over the entire life of the project. What are therefore the disadvantages of accounting rate of returns? Number one, it is not an absolute measure of profitability. It is not, it is not an absolute measure of profitability. It's not an absolute measure of profitability. Number two, it is fairly complicated to calculate. It is fairly complicated to calculate. It is fairly compli 
complicated to calculate. It is fairly com complete, complicated to calculate. Number three, it it uh, non-conventional cash flows may give rise to multiple errors. Non-conventional, conventional cash flows may give rise give rise to multiple multiple i r r non conventional cash flows may give rise to multiple internal rates of returns relevant cost relevant cost for mpv or irr let me just say relevant cost for discounting Remember, if you have watched my lecture or my presentation on relevant costing, I've told you that relevant costs are differential future cash flows. Differential future cash flows that arises in direct consequences of decision differential future cash flows that arises in direct consequences of decision that is relevant costing or relevant cost if this is relevant cost when we say differential meaning that for a cost to be relevant it must be a changes cost cost that change with activities all relevant costs are changes cost, meaning that costs that remain fixed, irrespective of the level of activity. Such costs are not relevant. Then we have future costs. Relevant costs are future costs. We said past costs are sunk costs, not sunk costs. Sunk costs are past costs, and sunk costs are not relevant. That means. For a cost to be relevant, it must not be a sunk cost. It must not be a past cost. If sunk costs are past costs, for a cost to be relevant, it must not be the cost, or it must not be the cost that have been incurred before the project is launched. Now, cash flows. All relevant costs are cash flows. Anything that doesn't involve the flows of cash are not relevant. No cash items such as depreciation, amortization, they are not relevant. So all relevant costs are cash flows. No cash items are not relevant. For a cost to be relevant, it must have arisen in direct consequences of the decision. Meaning that the purpose for which those costs are incurred. The cost, the, the purpose must relate to that project. That cost must be traced to the project under consideration. Cost that cannot be like it. Cost that cannot be attributed to the project under consideration are not relevant. Please take note of this. Now, I want to go into the relevant cost for MPV or IRM. I've told you that for better understanding, I will advise you to watch my earlier presentation on relevant costing. Now, Number one cost I'm going to examine is non-cash items. Non-cash items. Non-cash items are those items that doesn't involve the flows of cash. Those things that does not involve cash, they are non-cash items. They are items that arises on accrual-based principles. Remember the principle you normally used. You normally use in the preparation of your financial statement is accrual. Now, those things that you only allow them in accrual basis or principles that doesn't involve the flows of cash, those items are what we are talking about. Example of non cash item, we have depreciation. Depreciation does not involve cash flows, so it, should, it is not relevant. Amortization does not involve cash flows. Amortization is not a cash flow. Impairment loss is not a cash flow. 
So it is not relevant. Impairment loss, then loss, loss from disposal, from disposal of non-current assets. Disposal of non-current assets are not relevant. Profit from disposal, disposal of non-current assets. All these items does not involve the flows of cash. So anytime you see any of them, they are not relevant in decision making. Don't confuse the profit from disposal with the proceeds from disposal. The proceeds they are more realized from the sales of an asset. Should not confuse the proceeds with the profit. Profit is derived by subtracting the carrying amount from the proceeds. So where you have where the sales proceed of an asset is greater than the carrying amount of such an asset, then you arrive at the profit from the disposal. I've told you that profit from disposal of an asset is not relevant for decision making purpose, but the proceed is relevant. Take note of that. Number two item I'm going to consider is interest. Interest. The essence of discounting. The reason why we used to discount our cash flows is to account for the time value of money. The essence of discounting is to account for the time value of money. We equally used to charge interest in an account. We used to charge interest in account for because with the essence of the reason for charging interest is to account for the time value of money as well. If discounting, the purpose of discounting is to account for time value of money, and if interest too is charged in order to account for the time value of money, if you are now bringing in interest from interest on money borrowed to finance the project, if you are now bringing such interest into the computation of NPV or your cash flows for NPV or RR calculation purpose, if you are now bringing in those interest, it will amount to double counting. Therefore, any time you see interest or money borrowed to finance the project, when you see such item, you should ignore it. It is not relevant. I've told you, if you are bringing in interest into the calculation of your cash flows, I've told you it will amount to double counting. Therefore, interest should be ignored. Number three, we have general overheads. General General overheads. General overheads. General overheads. Overheads recovery. Or overheads. Overheads recovery. Or overheads absorption rate. Overheads absorption rate. These items are not relevant unless they are incremental unless they, they are incremental in nature number four working capital working capital this should be treated as an outflows in year zero working capital should be treated as an outflows in year zero and then be recovered in full at the end of the project life I said working capital should be treated as an outflows in year zero and be recovered and be recovered in full at the end of the project life and then be treated as an inflow. Meaning that when you have working capital now, year zero, you treat it as outflow. Then end of the project, end of the project life. Life, you treat it as an inflow. Outflow is year zero, then inflow at the end of the project life. Number five, timing of cash flows. Timing of cash flows or relevant year of cash flows or relevant year of cash flows now if the cash flows 
arises at the beginning of the year, if it arises at the beginning of the year, you should treat such cash flows in the immediate, in the immediate preceding year. Cash flows that arises at the beginning of the year, such cash flows should be treated in the immediate preceding year. What does that mean? If the cash flows arises at the beginning of the year of year two, if it arises at the beginning of year two, we are going to use that cash flow in year one. If it arises at the beginning of year one, then it will be used in year zero. If the cash flow arises at the beginning of year four, then you use it in year three. Cash flow that arises at the beginning of the year should be used in the immediate preceding year. Why cash flows? that arises at the end of the year should be used in that same year. If it arises at the end of year one, you use some cash flow in year one. If it arises at the end of year two, you use it in year two. If it arises at the end of year three, you use it in year three. Take note of that. That is what I mean by timing of cash flows. Number six, I have sunk cost. Sunk cost or committed cost. Committed cost. These are historical costs. They are past costs. Sunk costs are past costs. Example of sunk costs are preliminary expenses, research and development expenses. Sunk costs being the past cost. Remember, I've told you earlier that for a cost to be relevant, they must be futuristic. Relevant costs are future cash flows. Therefore, sunk costs are not relevant. Seven, we have capital expenditure. Capital expenditure. Expenditure on non-current assets. Expenditure on non-current assets. That is capital expenditure. So, this capital expenditure, e.g., we have expenditure on plant and machinery. Expenditure of on motor vehicles, land and buildings. This capital expenditure, we are going to categorize them into two. Bought in. Bought in capital expenditure and existing asset. Bought in, let me see, bought in assets and existing assets. By bought in assets, we mean they are assets that are specifically purchased for the project. Assets that are specifically purchased for the project that is bought in. That means the purpose of acquiring such an asset is because of the project under consideration. Without that project, such expenditure wouldn't have been incurred. So now that means opportunity cost of the project of such uh, capital expenditure is for you not to undertake the project. If you don't undertake the project, such costs will not be incurred. So that is bought in assets. So the amount incurred on such asset in year zero, you treat it as an outflow. Year zero, you treat it as an outflow. Then, end of the project life. End of the project life, you treat the scrap value as an inflows. So the expenditure of such asset, you, that means capital expenditure, you use it as an outflow in year zero and its scrap value as an inflows at the end of the project life. Existing assets. Where existing assets will be used in addition to a new one. The market estimate or the market value of the existing asset will be treated as an outflow in year zero and its scrap value as an inflow at the end of the project life. Where you are given an existing asset and that existing asset will be used in addition to a new one. The market value of the existing asset, you are going to use it as an outflow in year zero. Why its scrap value as an inflow at the end of the project life? However, where an existing asset will be sold or scrapped, or traded in, the market value of the existing asset is to be treated as an inflow in year zero. 
and its car value as an outflow at the end of the project life. If the existing asset, if it will be traded in, to trade in an asset me, to sell an existing asset, then the proceeds from the existing asset, you add money to it to buy another one. So that is trading. If the existing asset will be traded in to acquire another asset for the project, the trading value of the existing asset, you are going to treat it as an inflow, not outflow this time around. You treat it as an inflow in year zero. Why it's scrap value? You treat it as an outflow at the end of the project life, opposite of the earlier explanation. Please take note of this. But where you are given the cost of the existing asset, remember the cost of the existing asset. Since the existing asset has been bought sometime in the past, the cost of existing asset is a sunk cost. It is not relevant. The net book value of an existing asset too is just an accounting derivative. So it does not involve the flows of cash. The net book value, that is the current amount of the existing asset, is not relevant as well. So take note of this. Example. Oko is currently considering the launch of a new product. At market survey, was recently commissioned to assess the likely demand for the product. And this showed that product has an expected life of four years. The survey cost 30,000 naira, And this is due for payment in four months time. On the basis of the survey information, as well as internal management accounting information relating to costs, the assistant accountant prepared the following profit forecast for the product. We have here one, two, three, and four, a month in thousand naira. Says 180, 200, 160, 120 for year one, two, three, and four respectively. Cost of sales, 115, 140, 110, and 85 respectively. Gross profit, 65, 60, 50, and 35. Variable overheads, 27, 30, 24, and 18. Fixed overheads, 25, 25, 25, 25 for each of the years. Market survey written off, 30 for year one alone. We have the net profit or loss. Year one, loss of 17,000. Year two, profit of 5,000. Year three, profit of 1,000. Year four, loss of 8,000 naira. This profit forecast were viewed with disappointment by the directors. And there was a general feeling that the new product should not be launched. The chief executive pointed out that the product achieved profits in only two years of its four-year life. And that over the four-year period as a whole, a net loss was expected. However, before a meeting that had been arranged to decide formally the future of the products, the following additional information became available. Number one, the new product will require the use of an existing machine. This has a written down value of 80,000 Naira, but could be sold for 70,000 Naira immediately if the new product is not launched. If the product is launched, it will be sold at the end of the four-year period for 10,000 Naira. Two, additional working capital of 20,000 Naira will be required immediately and will be needed over the four-year period. It will be released at the end of the period. Note three. The fees overheads include a figure of $15,000 per year for depreciation of the machine and $5,000 per year for reallocation of existing overheads of the business. The company has a cost of capital of 10%. Ignore taxation. 
required. One, calculate the net present value of the project and its internal rate of returns. Two, advise whether or not the project should be launched. This question is obtained from Workout Performance Management by Ade Omolengwa. Now, let's have the solution. The name of entity is Oko. Let's have Oko. For the calculation of NPV, we will need the cash flows. Calculate working one. Calculation of cash flows. We have year four, year three, year two, and year one. A month in thousand. So we have six. Six, year one. 180, 200 for year two, 160 for year three, 120 for year four. 180, 200, 160, and uh, 120. We also have cost of six. Cost of six. Year one, we have 115. Year two, 140. Year three, 110. Year four, 85. Cost of six, 115. 140. 110. And uh, 85. Then we have variable over X, 27, 30, 24, and 18. Variable over X, 27, 30, 24, and 18. Back to the question. We have fixed overheads. 25 for each of the years. Year 1 to 4. Then we have market survey written off. Remember I told you fixed overheads. I said it's not relevant. The only one that will be relevant is avoidable one. Or specific or incremental fees overheads. Specific fees overheads are those overheads that are specifically in care for the project. Or that are specifically related to the project. That is specific fees overheads. You can, they can be, they arise in direct consequences of the project. Therefore, specific fees overheads will be avoid, uh, will be relevant. But avoidable fees overheads, they are fees overhead that can be saved if the project is not to be undertaken. Those fees overhead that will not be incurred if you did not undertake that project, we call them avoidable fees overheads. So for now, let's leave the fees overhead until we get to the note. Market survey written off. Remember, I've told you survey is a past cost. It's a past cost. It's a soft cost. So, therefore, it is not relevant. The new product will require the use of an existing machine. This has a written down value of 80,000. I've told you that it, this is a country derivative. I said this is not relevant. So, the neighbor value is not relevant. But could be sold for 70,000. This will be relevant immediately if the new product is not launched. Remember, we've talked about the existing asset that we are the existing asset is used in addition to a new one. That the market estimate of the existing asset will be treated as an outflow in year zero. Now, meaning that we were told it could be sold immediately for 70,000 if the new product is not launched. The condition for them to sell it is if the product is not launched. That means if the product is launched, it will be sold at the end of the four years period for 10,000. So this is the market estimate of the existing asset. So this will be treated as an outflow in year zero, then the square value as an inflow at the end of the project life. Note two, additional working capital of 20,000 will be required immediately. 
and it will be needed over the four-year life, four-year period. It will be released at the end of the period. I've told you about working capital. I've told you that working capital should be treated as an outflow year zero, then and be recovered in full at the end of the project life, and then be treated as an inflow. So 20,000 will be an if outflow year zero, then an inflow in year four. Note three. The fees of ice include a figure of 15,000 per year for depreciation. Remember, depreciation is not a cash flow. It's not relevant. Depreciation of the machine. And 5,000 per year for reallocation. I've told you that overhead allocation, apportionment overheads. I've told you they are not, or absorption, overhead absorption. I've told you they are not relevant. So meaning that this 5,000 is not relevant as well. 15,000 and 5,000 are not relevant. Reallocation of the existing overheads of the business. So 15,000 plus 5,000, 20,000 of the fees overheads. The fees overhead, 20,000 is not relevant. Now let's go back to the overheads detail. You are given fees to overheads, 25,000 per year. Remember, we said of this 25,000, 20,000 is not relevant. That means the remaining 5,000 will be the specific fees to overheads. Now let's have fees to overheads. Fees overheads, 25,000 minus 20,000, that is not relevant. So we'll be left with 5,000. The 5,000 is specific. Specific. So, the company cost of capital, you are given the cost of capital. Now, our cash flows now will be 180 minus 115 minus 27 minus 5. So you have 33,000 for year one. Year two, 200 minus 140 minus 30 minus 5. You'll be left with 25. Then year three, 160 minus 110 minus 24 minus 5. So you'll be left with 21,000. Year four, 120 minus 85 minus 18 minus 5. Then you have 12,000. This is one way of calculating the cash flows. If you don't want to calculate it this way, you can equally calculate it this way. So year 1, year 2, year 3, and year 4. This is another way of calculating the cash flows. So, you start with the net profit or loss as per account. Net profit or loss as per account. Let's go back to the financial statements. In year one, you have the loss of 17,000 in year two profit of 5,000 year three profit of 1,000 year four loss of 8,000 so year one you have loss of 17,000 year two profit of 5,000 year three profit of 1,000 year four you have loss of 8,000 now add no allowable items add no Sorry, add no relevant cost. Add no relevant cost. Those costs that are not relevant. Remember, we said of the fees overheads. We said something about the fees overheads is not relevant. Let's go back to the question. The fees overheads include a figure of fifteen thousand per year for depreciation. So of the fees overhead, we have depreciation. Depreciation of 15,000 per year. 15,000 you add. 15,000 per year. Then we also have per year for, and then we also have of the machine. And 5,000 per year for reallocation of existing overheads of the business. Overhead 
allocation, 5,000, it's not also relevant. Overhead, allocation of 5,000. We add it, 5,000. Then we also have market survey written up of 30,000 in year one. So we add it, market survey written up of 30,000 in year one. So you add it, you add no relevant expenses. So minus 17,000 plus 15,000 plus 5,000 plus 30,000 you have 33,000 5,000 plus 5,000 that is 20,000 plus 5,000 25,000 you have 3 1,000 uh, 1, plus 15,000 that is 16,000 plus 5,000 that is 21 thousand in year four minus eight minus eight plus fifteen plus five you have twelve in year four you have twelve thousand so if you compare the result obtained under this method with the result obtained in the first method you will discover that both methods both methods produce produce the same cash flows now that we have gotten our cash flows, the next thing is to calculate the net present value of the project. Calculation of the net present value. So you have year, four years are involved. Year zero, year one, year two, year three, and year four. Then the items involved. Items back to the question. You were told the product will require the use of an existing machine. This has a written down value of 80,000 naira. I've told you that this 80,000 is not relevant. But could be sold for 70,000 naira immediately. I've told you this one will be treated as an outflow. In year zero, then uh, I mean the 70,000 outflow in year zero, then its square value of 10,000 will be treated as an inflow at the end of the project life. So the items involved we have items, we have machine, 70,000 outflow in year zero, its square value of 10,000. Inflow at the end of the project life. Then we also have the working capital. Back to note two. You were told additional working capital of 20,000 naira will be required immediately and will be needed over the four year period. It will be released at the end of the period. I've told you that working capital should be treated as an outflow. Working capital. As an outflow, 20,000 naira in year zero, then it will be recovered at the end of the project life. We treat it as an inflow. Then the cash flows we've arrived at. The cash flows in year one, we have the cash flows of 33,000, in year two, 25,000, year three, 12, 21,000, year four, 12,000. Cash flow year one 33,000. 33, year two 25,000. Year three 21,000. Year four you have uh, 12,000. So our net cash flows, net cash flows. Minus 70,000 plus minus 70,000 to be minus 90,000. That is the outlay of 90,000. You have 33,000 as cash inflows in year one. 
25,000 as cash inflows in year two, 21,000 as the cash inflows in year three, in year four, 10,000 plus 20, that is 30,000, plus 12,000, that is 42,000. 42,000 in year four. Then the discount factor at the cost of capital you are given is 10 is 10 percent. Cost of capital, you were told the company has a cost of capital of 10%. That is how I got the 10%. The discount factor to calculate the discount factor, the formula is 1 plus r raised to the power minus n. 1 plus r raised to the power minus n. If our r is 10%, 10% cost of capital is 0 0.1. 10% is 10 over 100, which is 0 0.1. 1 plus 0 0.1 will be 1.1 1 .1 raised to power minus n. For year 0, we have 1.1 1 .1 raised to power 0 raised to power minus 0, it will be 1. Raised to power minus 0, it will be 1. For year 1, we have 1.1 1 .1 raised to power minus 1. That gives us 0. 0 0.9091 for year two we have 1.1 1 .1 raised to power minus two that gives us 0 0.8264 for year three we have 1.1 1 .1 raised to power minus three that gives us 0 0.7513 for year four we have 1.1 1 .1 raised to power minus 4. That gives us 0 0.6830. 0 .6830. Now, you now calculate the present value of that. The present value will be your net cash flow times the discount factor. Therefore, 90,000 minus 90,000 times 1. So you still have minus 90,000. For year two, and uh, year one, I mean, that is 3,000 times 0 0.9091. So we have 30,000, 30,000, 30,000. For year two, we have 25,000 times 0 0.8264. 8264, we have 20,660. 20,660. Now, year 3, 21,000 times 0 0.7513. We have 15,777. Year 4, you have 42,000 times 0 0.6830. So we have 28,686. 28,686. The net present value. Let's add the cash inflow. 28,686 plus 15,777 plus 20,660 plus 30,000 minus outflows of 90,000 minus 90,000. So we have 5,123 positive. So that is our net present value. We have the net present value of 5,123. Since our net present value is positive, that is to show that the project is viable. Now, remember, if you go back to the requirement, you have to calculate the net present value of the project and its internal rate of returns. So we want to calculate the internal rate of returns of the project. Since our calculated net present value is positive, we will need to calculate another net present value that will be negative. Now, the rate used to calculate the, net, the positive net present value is 10%. So to get a negative net present value, we use a rate that is higher than 10%. So, true trial and error method.
Now let's try 14%. So we have year, year 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Our cash flows. So year 0, 90,000. Year 1, 33,000. Year 2, 25,000. Year 0, 90,000. Year 1, 33,000. Year 2, 25,000. Year 3, 21,000. Year 4, 42,000. Year 3, 21,000. Year 4, 42,000. We want to calculate negative net present value. Let's try... This can factor of, let's try 14%. Year 0, we have 1. Or let me use 20%. 20%. Year 0, 1. It's always 1. Year 1, you know the formula is 1 plus R raised to power minus N. If R is 20%, 20% is 0.2. 1 plus 0.2, that will be 1.2 raised to power minus n. So for year one now, we have 1.2 raised to power minus one. That gives us 0 0.8333. 0 0.8333. Year two, 1.2 raised to power minus two. That gives us 0 0.69. Four, four. Year 3, 1.2 raised to power minus 3. That gives us 0 0.5787. Year 4, 1.2 raised to power minus 4. That gives us 0 0.4823. 482. Three. Now, let's calculate the present value of that. So 90,000 negative times y, that will be minus 90,000. 33,000 times 0 0.8333. That gives us 27,499. Year 2, 25,000 times 0 0.6944. That gives us 17,360. Year 3, 21,000 times 0 0.5787. That gives us 12,153. Year 4, 42,000 times 0 0.48. Two, three. So that gives us 20,257. So the net present value 20,257 plus 12,153 plus 17,360 plus 27,499. The total present value of cash inflows is 77,269 minus 90,000. That gives us minus 12,731. Our net present value is negative. By interpolation, I said the formula is IRR equal to lower rate plus net present value at lower rate over net present value at lower rate minus net present value at higher rate then into higher rate minus lower rate this is the formula the lower rate was the first rate of 10 percent the 10 percent given in the question which is 10 and that is the lower rate the net present value at lower rate is 5,123 5,123 so we have lower rate 
lower rate 10 plus MPV at lower rate 5,000, 1, 2, 3 over MPV at lower rate 5,000, 1, 2, 3 minus MPV at higher rate. MPV at higher rate, our higher rate is 20%. MPV at 20% is 12,731 minus 12,731. So we have minus 12,731 into higher rate. Higher rate is 20% minus lower rate, 10%. So we have 10 plus 5,123 times 20 minus 10, that is 10, over 5,123 minus minus plus plus 12,731. So, which is 10 plus, if you multiply this, we have 5, 1, 2, 3, 0, 51,230 over, what is the sum of this? So, 5,123 plus 12,731. Total, 17,854. So, we have 10 plus 51,230. Divided by 17,854. So, we have 2.87. 2.87. Therefore, the internal rate of return equal to, if you sum up this, 12.87%. So, that is the internal rate of returns. You are to recommend on the viability of the investment project. This IRR is greater than the cost of capital of 10%. The project is financially worthwhile. And our MPB, based on the cut-off rate you are given, 10% is positive. Since the net present value is positive, that means the investment is worthwhile. The entity should undertake the investment. So this is the end of the solution to this question. My next presentation, I will examine the transition in the investment decision. I will equally examine the impact of inflation in capital investment decision. Please, your comment is very essential. Also like the video. Thanks for watching, Ezekiel.